Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Forward Think Tank podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Mazza, and I am back with episode two, another solo pod from yours truly. So if you're new to the podcast, what I am talking about here is my healing journey. So I was diagnosed with a rare thymic tumor and also an autoimmune disorder, myasthenia gravis, almost a year ago. And honestly, it came to a total, uh, came as a total shock to me and of course my loved ones because everybody knew me as the health coach, as the fitness instructor, as somebody who ate really healthy and you know took care of themselves and did all the right things. So how did somebody like me at the young age of 36 wind up with a diagnosis like this? So I want to spend some time in episode two retracing my steps. And I'm not doing this in a way to make myself feel neurotic because so many people, especially the ones closest to me, asked me when we found this, you know, what do you think caused it? Or where do you think this came from? And truthfully, this may be an answer that we never get to the bottom of. But I want to take you back, you know, maybe 10 years ago to 20 year old Jamie, um, because I do spend time thinking about this and not to a point of, you know, regret or shame or driving myself crazy, but I think it's important to bring light to some of this information. The the health crisis that's happening in this country and some of the underlying you know, conditions or symptoms that may be flaring inside of your own body or somebody that you know and love so that you can course correct it. And I'm not saying that everybody that goes through things like this will wind up with a diagnosis like me, but I do think between our food industry and the way things are regulated and marketed and produced to be addicting with so many different types of preservatives and added sugars and refined grains. And then you layer in the plastics in a lot of our personal care products and even food items. And then you layer in stress of the modern day world, our technology, how fast we're all working and multitasking all the time, our lack of sleep, our lack of movement, and so many other factors. And Sometimes it can make even the healthiest person at risk of whether it's metabolic syndrome, inflammation, stress-related conditions, or really just bog down our immune system. So I want to spend some time talking about some things that I've noticed for myself over the course of the last decade and you know whether or not they could have contributed to what is happening inside of me right now. I am somebody who truly trusts my gut and I've had a lot of things happen in my life. You know, some of them be health supportive and some of them maybe be a little bit of a setback. And I think everybody is different, even diagnosis to diagnosis. Everybody is completely unique. And when I'm working with clients of mine in terms of health coaching, there's no one size fits all to diet. There's no one size fits all approach to managing someone's lifestyle. And so I do believe that there's no one size fits all approach to managing a diagnosis like this. Got interviewed on a podcast recently, the first time I've ever talked about this on the Is It Hard podcast with Jenna and Jesse. So that episode will be coming out hopefully in the coming weeks. But it was the first time I ever talked about what has been going on with me. And it was a wonderful conversation. I want to thank Jenna for holding that space for me. But it's funny because I, if you get to know me, if you don't know me personally, you know that I'm often throwing in, you know, a little bit of comedy or some jokes here and there. And sometimes it's just to make myself laugh or like break the ice. And I think that came from me being a pretty shy child growing up. So you'll probably see me do that a lot here, especially because these topics can be heavy for the most part. So I actually said to Jenna, and who knows if this will be edited out, you know, this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. For anyone who's a fan of Fresh Prince, I certainly grew up watching that. But that's what was in my head as I sat there getting ready to talk about that. It's like, 
I thought my life was going a certain way and then boom, you know, this happened. So here we are. But in all of the research I've been doing over the last year now, really getting more information about what can cause these types of situations, but more importantly, how to help heal them. Because I think if we get too stuck in what caused this and what could I have done differently, that doesn't serve you. Whether this is, yeah, you know, you're hearing this and you're saying, yeah, dealt with a lot of mental health issues when I was in my 20s and I was always wishing I could go and turn back time if I could only go back to high school and make a different decision, you know, in what I was going to do in college or if I can only go back to college and do things differently or if I can go back to this conversation and say something differently to someone. Here's the reality. Going back in time in your mind, you can't change that. So it really set me up to often feel depressed and you know a little bit lacking and less than. So that is something I'm going to touch on a little bit in more detail. But when you are so focused on how can I change the past or what could I have done differently, it's not productive. So I encourage you, if that's resonating at all, to always think instead about how can I problem solve in the moment? Because truthfully, this moment this present time that you're sitting here with me listening to this episode, this is all we have. We don't necessarily know what the future holds. We don't know what the past holds. We have now. So I encourage you to empower yourself to think more productive thoughts in terms of that. But knowing that these tumors can take time to develop in your body. And it's really a combination of your immune system not recognizing and attacking these cells as they continue to grow and proliferate and strengthen. And then maybe some underlying things that are also going on in our body that just are working against us that are causing inflammation. And you know, when inflammation is prevalent in our body or in our mind um, or in our cells, it can further weaken our immune system. I sat there when I heard that and I thought back to what was going on in my life 10 years ago and what has happened over the course of leading up to this diagnosis that could have possibly contributed to what's going on. And again, I am sharing this information because I think it's important to talk about. I hope that this is going to be a resource for anybody who knows somebody who has some sort of diagnosis of their own going on or just wants to be proactive with their health because I think the more we can take care of ourselves and be proactive, we're setting ourselves up for sustainable, healthy future and longevity. So when I think back to my 20s, a few things come to mind. And again, this is thinking of the connection to inflammation. Now, Short-term acute inflammation is important. It's how our body heals itself. So for example, if you were to get a paper cut on your finger, inflammation is going to surge to that finger of yours and it's going to maybe swell up a little bit, get a little bit warm, get a little bit red, and your immune system is going to send a response and a reaction to that finger and help it to heal. So short-term acute inflammation is necessary and important, but when chronic inflammation is running in your body, and that could be mental health related, it could be from stress, it could be hormone related, it could be um, you know, some metabolic dysfunction, it could be your immune system is you know, downregulated. That is when a host of other issues can present themselves. So when I think back to 10 years ago, the first thing that comes to my mind is I was somebody who always struggled with acne, cystic acne, ever since I was, you know, pretty much a teenager or got into that, like the years of puberty, always struggled with breakouts. And unfortunately, I didn't have the understanding of holistic health and nutrition and the fact that what we know now is our gut microbiome is so interconnected to what's happening on the surface of our skin. So if you have some digestive issues, that can present itself in visibly in terms of acne. And when I went to the dermatologist, it was also something that ran in my family. My mom also said she struggled with breakouts. What they did is they want to band-aid the issue or, you know, of course they want to help the issue. But I think looking back in terms of what that did to kind of set me back is I was prescribed antibiotics. I was prescribed every topical gel, pill, cream you could ever imagine. And then ultimately in my early 20s, I was also presented with birth control as a way to 
help my skin, which now I'm realizing, oh my goodness, like who knows what that did? We're the first generation of women to be on birth control for long periods of time. So just some food for thought, right? So I was on all these different medications, all these different antibiotics. We know now that antibiotics can definitely do a number on our gut microbiome. Our gut microbiome also influences what's happening in the rest of our body with our immunity, with our immune system in general, with our mental health. So as I think a domino effect of all of that, well, yes, sometimes my skin would get to a point where those pills and potions were helping, it never really corrected the problem. My skin would always come back and like, you know, chronically be inflamed in some way. I was wearing tons of makeup at the young age of like 12, 13, trying to cover things up. You know, meanwhile, some of that is just kind of normalcy as your hormones shift into puberty. And then the other piece of it could have been, well, what else is going on behind the scenes? I grew up, um, you know, I am a big mutt in terms of like all the European countries. My mom's side is Italian and Greek. My dad's side is French, English, German. And like we came to find out like a little bit Irish. So I'm definitely a combination of different European backgrounds. But I would say in terms of how my family ate, we definitely ate a lot of Italian food. I grew up going to my grandma's Almost every Sunday, we would do pasta. There was a lot of bagels, bread, all of that in my household all the time. You know, cereals, all the things. And we just didn't know then what we know now about food and also the way that this country manufactures food has dramatically changed from the way that our ancestors were eating it. So there was probably a lot of aggravation and inflammation in my system happening all the time because honestly fast forward like 10 12 15 years i try as much as possible well especially with what's going on right now i'm actually eating i'm in a therapeutic ketogenic diet so i'm reducing my carb intake significantly to help manage what's going on and i'll talk more about that in like the coming episodes i even you know 10 years ago when i started health coaching i took a lot of gluten out of my diet a lot of processed sugar, refined food. So I was doing much less of the pasta, pizza, you know, all of those things. And I found that my skin as a result started to change and started to heal. So inflammation was what was going on. And in my days after college, I really struggled, honestly, for years, struggled with what I wanted to do with my life. And that is more just like a personal identity crisis. So I studied psychology in undergrad, and I always knew that I wanted to help people. But when I thought about going to grad school, I really couldn't make a decision. I was so indecisive, and this really kind of dragged along with me for many years. I always thought that making big decisions like that in terms of career or any sort of major life change were so daunting and so final, which now we know that, or I understand that it's not. I could always change my mind and I can do that at any time, but it felt very intimidating for me to move forward and decide what I wanted to do for grad school. I, there was all these different opportunities for what I could do with my psych degree and I just got so overwhelmed. So I decided to not go to grad school. Fast forward, I found the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and at the time I was teaching fitness in the city, I was working business. And so I found that and I was like, wow, this is something where I feel like I can really make an impact on people, also help heal myself along the way and really just married all of my passion. But I remember being at such a crossroads with going to grad school and I knew for whatever reason, I knew that I did not want to be a psychiatrist who was prescribing medication. It's like weird thinking back that I just like had that gut instinct and it's like, well, there's so many other ways that you can help. I didn't really understand and know. I feel like now fast forward, I've done so much research on how to help and support your mental health. but. It's funny because after not being able to make that decision, it really spiraled my own mental health into a hard place. I feel like I struggled for years thinking too much about the future, which made me anxious, wishing I could go back and do things differently in the past, which sometimes would make me depressed, comparing myself to all my peers around me who were climbing the corporate ladder or starting businesses or you know just doing these really incredible things and they just seem to have the momentum to keep putting one foot in front of the other and going, going, going. So 
I had the skin issues going on, which probably then connected to gut issues. I had a roller coaster of emotions in terms of my mental health. So, but did I think any of these things were abnormal at the time? No, they were honestly pretty common, which is unfortunate because even though it's common, it doesn't make those symptoms normal. Fast forward to my 30s, um, I got married at the age of 29 and I knew at that point that I wanted to leave my corporate job, Nick and I wanted to buy a home. I felt a little bit pigeonholed at the job that I was in because I knew I didn't love it. I took it on because honestly I needed the money and I was living in New York City and sure there were a lot of perks of having a corporate job, it looked great on paper, but it never fulfilled my soul and my purpose. I was doing the health coaching on the side, not fully believing that I had the power and the ability to be successful in it where I could do it on my own. So there was always this like lack and this self-confident issue. I was also teaching Zumba and dance fitness on the side at the time, which was a huge passion of mine and it brought me so much joy. But I was living in New York. I was running around like a crazy person all the time, always overflowing, filling my plate, saying yes to everything that came to me, and honestly probably burning the candle at both ends. Unhappy with my job, issues with my mental health, skin issues, going crazy for you know 15 years. And that oftentimes wound me up in places of, of burnout. You know, everyone says your wedding day should be the best day of your life and the best time of your life. I was the first one out of all of my sisters and really my, my mom's side of the family to get married. So it was a big deal. I remember my mom saying, well, it's my wedding too. You know, of course my parents are incredible and I love them so much and they did so much to support us during that time. You know, it was a big financial undertaking. It became so stressful to me because I was also at that job that I didn't like and you know, all these other things, but I just, I got so overwhelmed and stressed out that truthfully I felt my wedding day and the days that followed even on my honeymoon, like I was a bit of a zombie. And truthfully, I was probably in some hormonal state of burnout. I was still on birth control at the time, which is something I continued for honestly like 14 years. And so my hormones weren't even in a state where they could regulate themselves. I just honestly felt like a shell of myself, which really freaked me out. That was the first time I felt really like depleted after something major happening in my life at a point where I thought I should be my happiest. So I was not at a point where I thought that I wanted to start a family immediately. I, you know, and I would talk about our goals quite often. I had the goal of leaving my corporate job and really pursuing this coaching and pursuing this wellness career, but we wanted to buy a house or, you know, we actually live here in Jersey City, so we live in a multifamily. My husband's in real estate and always encourage that and and honestly, I'm glad that he did. There's definitely some perks to that. But we had these life goals that we wanted to accomplish, so I felt like I wasn't at a point where I could leave my corporate job, so I sucked it up, stayed there, wasn't really happy, but was trying to do all these things like the Zumba and the coaching and, you know, again, just constantly filling my plate, running all over the city, burning my candle at both ends. So when we thought about starting a family or even just the thought of that as our friends started to do that, I was like, whoa, like late 20s, I'm like, I'm not there yet. And truthfully, there were times where I doubted whether or not I would be a good mother because of the mental health roller coaster that I had been on in my 20s. I got to some pretty dark places and I was like, well, no child deserves to have that be their role model. Like, I want to get to a point where I'm happy with myself and I'm happy with my life and I can set a good example for my children. So we really did put off trying to start a family for a few years. So that brings me to another point, which, you know, again, this is very personal for me. It's it's kind of amazing me. This is my second solo episode with how easy it is to talk about myself, especially on these topics that can be really personal. But I do think that it's important. And ever since I received this news of what's going on in my health, I have this overwhelming feeling from what I believe is God, call it what you want, the spirit, the universe, but I do believe it was God 
telling me in the hospital almost a year ago, yeah, Jane, this is crazy, but you're going to learn from this. You're going to share this story. You are meant to inspire others. So that has kind of been a guiding light and a guiding voice of encouragement for me to even create this podcast. So as I talk about these things that are highly personal, I somehow feel okay doing it. So, and I know so many people can relate to these things and that's why I think it's super important. I think if you don't know me personally, but you continue to listen to these episodes, you'll see I don't really sugarcoat much. I'm a pretty open book. So I hope that this helps people who are going through similar things find comfort in knowing that they're not alone, but also helps you maybe recognize that, yeah, I've got some of these things going on. So I want to make sure I can take care of myself and be proactive and help my body heal. So we got to the point around the pandemic where I remember the entire world just shut down. We all experienced it. I was no longer having to go into the city to work my corporate job. It was kind of just like, oh my God, what am I doing with my life? Like we all thought it was going to be two weeks, right? So I'm like, yay, let's have fun. And I'm going to continue to like coach on the side. And I was teaching some corporate workshops around wellness and it was all fun. But then the loneliness continued to set in because we were so removed from society. And thank God Nick and I had each other. You know, I know there were some people who were experiencing the pandemic truly in solitude and alone, which we know loneliness can be even more detrimental than some other health issues that are plaguing our country. There I was working this job that I hated, not really knowing what I wanted to do with my life, watching so many people around me during that time see this as an opportunity to start a family. And so I remember I had had issues with my menstrual cycle over, I would say the last five years. It in points of very high stress, I my reproductive system would shut down, which makes sense from a biological perspective. When you are in a high state of stress and your cortisol is running rampant, it has the ability to totally overtake and dysregulate your other hormones. It's, it's one of those master hormones. So when you are stressed, what often happens? We have digestive issues. Maybe we are constipated or maybe we have the opposite problem where our bowels are like overactive, but oftentimes it like shuts down digestion. So back in the day, unfortunately, our nervous systems have not evolved even though the modern world has evolved. So I'm sure you've heard this analogy fight or flight mode when we were cave people and we received a threat in the form of maybe like a lion coming to attack us, we had to either flee or fight. So your body is at a point where the adrenaline rush gets sent to your system and prepares you to either flee or fight. And fast forward to the modern world and that may not look like a tiger coming to attack you, but that may be you walking across the street and a car who's not paying attention comes up and almost hits you, sends this chain reaction of um, you know, nervous system dysregulation, or that could be the form of your boss pinging you Slack or you getting constantly interrupted with group messages and notifications or you know whatever else is happening that's causing stress in our modern world. Our body doesn't know any different, so biologically it's going to react the same and your body is going to prepare to fight or flee we're in a state of perceived stress. So I had had some issues with my menstrual cycle when I was in extreme states, extreme states of stress where my reproductive health would shut down and I wouldn't get my period. So it was something that I thought I had regulated with the help of acupuncture. Hopefully in a future episode, you will see me talk to my wonderful friend. She's an incredible healer. I really think she is pure magic, Erin Kumpf, who I've been working with since 2019 to help uh, balance my hormones, help regulate my cycle, and help with a host of other things because I think acupuncture could help with pretty much anything. When we got to a point where we were like three or four months into it and my cycle started to shut down again. So then fast forward a couple months later, I started experiencing really strange symptoms that I was like, oh my God, like what is happening in my body? I remember feeling like a trickle of sweat on my forehead. I was like, oh my God, am I having night sweats? You know, trouble with digestion. My skin started to get crazy again. So all of these hormone related things 
were going on under the hood or, you know, coming out visibly on my skin. So I end up going to see a primary care doctor, cherry pick some hormones and do some testing and find that my hormones are extremely out of whack. So that led me to going to see some fertility specialist. And what they told me was that, you know, your hormones are highly dysregulated, certain things that should be low are high, certain things that should be high are low. They looked at my follicle count. At that point, I was 34 years old or had just turned 34, so like 33, 34, and things just weren't working right. Um, they were seeing a low follicle count for somebody who's my age, and that was really scary to hear because I, again, always thought I was someone who took care of myself, who didn't have to worry if I wanted to have kids later in life. And then I got smacked with this weird new reality. And then fast forward a little bit further into uh, January of 2021. And one of my best friends, um, and I, I do believe that this was a combination of struggles with mental health and also the solitude being alone in the pandemic, she took her life. And that is something that forever rattled my system. Within a week of each other, I get that news. And then I get the news that, you know, you're having fertility issues. Again, looking back over the last decade, bringing it forward to this diagnosis and seeing what was going on, we've got stress, we've got emotional problems, we've got inflammation in terms of acne, in terms of gut health issues, burnout. We've got emotional stress, which emotional inflammation was a term that I had never heard until I started working with another acupuncturist who had been helping me try to get pregnant over the last few years. Emotional inflammation is real. So I can honestly say between all of those things, and then you layer in starting fertility treatments, adding in hormone replacement. So my estrogen was really low, so we tried to replace that. Come to find out, when I started working with my team of metabolic health doctors and naturopathic oncologists and started listening to some of the podcasts that Dr. Nasha Winters, who developed this metabolic approach to treating cancer, estrogen is part of the female reproductive system and that helps our follicles to mature every month. It helps babies to grow in the uterus. So I'm sitting there taking that, likely had this all going on because this was only a couple years ago, likely had a the tumor already developed inside of me. Estrogen can be a proliferator for cancer cells. So it just felt like the perfect storm of all of these things going on and did I think that that's what was happening inside of me? No. But did I have a sense that something was up? And I'll never forget in the beginning of the pandemic when we, you know, or maybe not everyone, but I started working out a lot from home, didn't have the mirrors in front of me because I was used to taking group fitness classes. I started noticing a pain in my shoulder, like in my back. And for those of you who don't know where the thymus is, it's below your thyroid. Um, but it kind of sits in like that breastbone area and it's under your rib cage. So I started noticing this pain almost directly behind that in my back and my shoulder, thinking it was something I was doing where I was maybe working out too hard or I pulled a muscle and was not really sure how to manage it because not a lot of people were going to the doctor at the time. But who knows? Was that the tumor growing, making itself comfortable, trying to make itself known to me? I'm trying to get my attention. We will never know. And did I think that there was something chronically wrong? Did I think that there was this major health issue brewing inside of me? Absolutely not. One of the things that I think is incredible about the work I do with these metabolic doctors, they have you take a series of tests and assessments and they look at different terrains in your body. And there are so many different ones. You know, gut and nutrition, health is one of them, stress, genetics, lifestyle factors, all of these different things we look at and we see what's going on under the hood so that we can correctly address, assess, and then try to support to heal and correct when it comes to getting a serious diagnosis like this because there are so many different things 
that can influence what's happening in someone's body and dysregulate our immune system and cause issues like this to go undetected. So our, our you know, I'm speaking very generally about all of these things, but I do hope to have some of these doctors that I've worked with over the last year on this podcast so they can further elaborate and go into a little bit more detail on how our body works. But our immune system is meant to clean up and clear out any cells that aren't properly functioning in our body. But when there is chronic inflammation happening, when there's some immune system dysregulation, so come to find out, I had a lot of a heavy viral load. So I had had a very mild case of Bell's palsy, which seemingly came out of nowhere like a decade ago. It was very mild, but they really didn't do anything about it. They were kind of like, okay, it's mild. You know, let us know what happens. It eventually went away. Our body should be manage what's happening when there is an invasion on our immune system, whether that's a viral load, a bacterial infection, or, you know, some sort of injury. We should be able to heal from that. But when there is a lot going on under the radar that's really distracting our immune system, so not only did I have that in the past, and they say that viruses truly sit in our system. They don't necessarily fully clear out. They can just kind of lay undetected. And then when something happens, when we're stressed out, when our immune system is on like high alert or we have inflammation happening in our body, it wakes itself up again and rears its evil little head. So I had a case of that. I think like pretty much everyone, at least here in the US, I had COVID a couple times. And then doing some energy healing work with my therapist, which I also hope to have her on this podcast because she's incredible and I wanna go into more detail specifically on this energy healing. She sensed some viruses in my system and at the time I was recovering from COVID. I was like, is it that? She's like, I don't know. She's like, I'm sensing something more. Did you ever have Epstein-Barr? I'm like, no, that's the monovirus. I never had that as a kid. Um, That was like the kissing virus, right? Like, no, never had that to my knowledge. She's like, I would just do some testing. So I do monthly lab work with my naturopaths and it's incredible how much we can see from month to month and assess you know, what's going on, maybe what's happening in our bloodstream as a result, what's happening in our body, how my inflammation markers are looking and you know everything else going on. We tested for Epstein-Barr and come to find out my antibodies were off the charts. They were in like the 500s, which is mind-blowingly high. So it didn't mean that I had a current case of Epstein-Barr or active necessarily, but it meant that my body had produced antibodies to it. It indicated either a prior infection or current infection, likely a prior infection. So I had this viral storm happening as well. And it's just like, wow, holy crap. You think you know your body. You know, people have said to me over the years, especially in doing this work as a health coach, you're so connected to your body. You're so in tune. You take such good care of yourself, you do all the right things. It almost made me feel when I got this diagnosis, like I, it felt like my body was like this foreign person that I had no idea existed. Like I had no idea that this was going on because I had zero symptoms. So typically a thymoma because of where it is in your body, it sits close to your heart, sits close to your lungs. People can have symptoms such as coughs, wheezing, shortness of breath, chest pain, difficulty doing certain activities. And I truly believe it's because of how physically fit I was, how I do feed my body, that my body was able to maintain a sense of health and not have any of these symptoms. So when I wound up in the hospital, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on on what brought me there. So I mentioned in the beginning of this episode that I also got diagnosed with myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune reaction. And truthfully, I don't really understand the correlation or how it works, but from what I have gathered and everything that the doctors have told me, not everybody who gets diagnosed with a thymoma gets diagnosed with myasthenia gravis, and also not everyone who gets diagnosed with myasthenia gravis has a thymoma, but there are some cases where they present together, and for whatever reason, that was my only symptom that I had. So 
leading up, you know, months prior to the diagnosis, I was on a lot of fertility medication, hoping to get pregnant. And who knows what that was actually doing and brewing inside of me, but I started to have issues with my eyes. So at first it seemed like, oh, I just wanted to rub my eye. It felt like I wear contacts. I've worn contacts and glasses for years, like two decades at this point. So I was like, I haven't been to the eye doctor. I feel like maybe I need to up, up my prescription or go get my eyes checked. So I did that. I went a couple times and in my one eye, my doctor has always noted over the years that I have an astigmatism, but we never gave the special lenses to correct it because I seemed to, it seemed to be a pretty mild case and I was okay without them. He's like, I'm going to give you this sample, go home and try that special lens and let's see if that helps. Did absolutely nothing. Meanwhile, this is continuing to get worse. I was rubbing my eye a lot. I was having to like close one eye to do some, you know, daily activities, things at work, being able to see clearly on the computer screen started to freak me out, right? So I had no idea what was going on, but a little light bulb popped into my head and I was like, maybe this is related to the fertility meds. So called my fertility doctor, asked if that could be possible. They said, doesn't happen often, but it certainly could be. So why don't you wean off those meds and see if it helps? And if it helps, then okay, we know it was that. And if not, then let us know. So wean off the meds. It just continues to get worse to the point where I was literally walking around like this for anyone who knew me a year ago or saw me a year ago. It was like, what the hell's going on with you, Jamie? And went back to the eye doctor, couldn't figure it out, didn't seem to be a muscle thing, like they really weren't sure. So I was working out from my home and I was looking up at a crack in my ceiling, which was just like a single crack, but when I looked at it with the state of my eyes and the way that they were presenting and helping me see or not see, it looked like it was the shape of an L instead of just like a one line. So I was like, that's weird. Like did the crack in my ceiling just grow overnight? And then I closed that one eye so I could see clearly and I saw that it was a single line. So that's when I knew, holy SHIT, I am seeing double, like something is wrong. So I went back to the eye doctor. He couldn't figure it out. I'm sitting there in tears because I could tell at that point that something was seriously wrong. I didn't know what was causing it. He sent me to see a neuro-ophthalmologist, which by the way, by some grace of God, but I remember calling countless, and again, I live in the New York metropolitan area, so I remember trying to contact a neuro-ophthalmologist from my doctor's office so I could maybe just go right then that day because I was closing one eye to get around no availability. And at that point, that was October, no availability till like December or January. I'm like, I can't walk around like this for the next three months. Like something is seriously wrong. So I went home pretty much in tears and so emotional, called doctors in New Jersey, called doctors in New York, was getting ready to call doctors in Pennsylvania. And here was a little glimmer in this journey. I called Wild Cornell and just, you know, randomly Googled and I got some sweet little angel on the phone. And I said, when is your next availability? She said, not until November. I'm like, listen, and this is where I fully support anyone who has something going on where you feel like you have a symptom that needs to be addressed and it's not in your head and it's not normal to be an advocate for yourself and speak up. I said, listen, I am having double vision. I am walking around with one eye open to do my daily activities something is seriously wrong. Is there any way that you might be able to find an appointment for me sooner? And she was so sweet and she listened and she apologized and she said, listen, let me find out. I'm not the person that can make that decision, but I'm going to talk to the on-call nurse and she deals with more emergent situations. And if she thinks that this is an emergency, I'll have her get back to you and give you a call. So we left it at that gave her my number. And within a half hour, I had a call from the nurse, which of course shook me because then it's like, okay, well, we know this is emergent. She was able to get me in, in three days. So it was later that week that I was able to go see the doctor, which led me to the hospital, which led me to all of these assessments and doing all these tests and finally discovering what was going on. But to back up a little bit, 
when I was in the hospital, they were shocked that I had no obvious symptoms. The only thing that presented that anything was wrong, that I had this giant tumor growing inside of me was the autoimmune reaction that eventually presented itself. And I have to be grateful for that, as scary as that was. It was the only thing that gave any indication that something was going wrong, something was brewing under the hood. So if I want you to take anything out of this episode, I want you to make sure you're being an advocate for your health. If you feel like something is wrong and I just really aired out my dirty laundry, Jamie, what you doing? But you know, I spent some time thinking about these things. And I even remember saying to my husband when we were struggling with the fertility situation and trying to do all the things and still couldn't get to the bottom of what was dysregulating these hormones and making them high, low, and all over the place. I remember saying to him, or at least thinking, like, is something more serious wrong with me? And of course we wanted to say no because I presented as a healthy person, but there are so many things that can be happening in our body that can get dysregulated from the modern world that we live in or use of antibiotics or use of over abuse, I think, of our modern food. And that can relate to digestive issues, which can cause you know a domino effect of a whole other things. If you're stressed, if you're burnt out, if you are having trouble with your hormones, having serious traumatic things happen in your life, these can all have an impact on how our body regulates. So I'm not, absolutely not sitting here saying, because you have one or two of these things, you need to be concerned that you have a diagnosis like me. But what I'm trying to do is share this information for anybody who needs to hear it, for anyone who feels like you have a symptom that you can tell is not normal for your body, even though the doctors may say, oh, nothing to worry about, or, oh, we can do something about that. I encourage you to be an advocate for your own health. If you are listening to this, thinking about someone in your life who has also received a diagnosis of their own, I encourage you to share this episode. There are so many things that we can do to help and support these things that are happening in our body once we identify them which is why I am eternally grateful for the work with these naturopathic doctors. Because honestly, yes, there is a time and a place for Western medicine. There is a time and a place for, you know, my oncologist, as much as I didn't want to have to do some of the work that we've been doing together. There is a time and a place for surgery, which may or may not be on in, you know, my future. But I have to say that unfortunately, and it's probably because of how much they pack their patient load every day, and and maybe because of their lack of training with nutrition and lifestyle, it's like, here's your prescription, here's your med, good luck, this is going to do its job, but they don't ever talk about how to clean up your system, how to help support inflammation that's going on in your body, how to make sure your hormones are regulated, how to help with your digestion, the right type of foods to eat to support your body when you're going through a healing process. And that is where I found that these naturopathic doctors have been absolutely, absolutely instrumental so important. Even as somebody who is aware of how to take care of my health, I think I've gotten such a schooling over the last year and I've dramatically changed so many things. And because we assess my blood work every month, we're seeing how that is affecting what's happening in my body. So I encourage you, if you're listening, to be an advocate for your health, to look kind of outside of the box of modern medicine and say, what else can I do to support my health and my lifestyle and allow my body to heal and recover? Because I truly think it is a blessing that I am sitting here having this conversation, feeling as good as I'm feeling. And I truly know that that's because of all the work that I have been doing to support my body, to ask questions, to get to the root cause of what's going on and to help support my healing process on a cellular level, on a mental level, on an emotional level, and all of those things. So I kind of had you know, a loose outline of what I was going to talk about today and wasn't really sure how this conversation was going to go, but you know, there are so many things that can cause our body to get out of harmony. 
in future episodes, I'm really going to talk in more detail about what I'm doing to help reduce that inflammation, to bring my body back into harmony, to connect myself back with the earth, to slow down and regulate my nervous system because all of these things are a huge part of the healing journey too. And listen, I appreciate you being here. I am so grateful for the support I received with just this first episode that I put out last week. I plan to put these episodes out so it's out on a weekly basis, whether that is more solo episodes or we're going to be getting into some conversations with my husband, my healers, my doctors, other people who are on the other side of their healing journey with their own diagnosis. I cannot wait for these episodes to unfold and I appreciate your support more than you know. So because of all this happening, I've been working pretty part-time while I'm solely focused on my healing as really what feels like two and a half full-time jobs. So putting this podcast out there has been incredibly important for me. I do believe it's part of my healing journey as well. If this resonated with you, please, please, please share this episode, download it, save it, subscribe to the podcast and something else I want to put out there that, listen, I am not expecting this by any means, but there is a way to show listener support on Spotify to support this podcast. If this is something that you look forward to listening to in the weeks to come and hey, give it a few more weeks if you want, there is a way to directly support via listener support on the podcast. You'll see it in the show notes below. I'll put a link for it. There is a way to support monetarily what I'm putting out there and the content that I'm creating. Absolutely zero pressure, but I appreciate the support so much. Even if it's sharing the episode or you know writing a review, if you found this helpful, leaving some comments, I love to hear from you. I love to see that what I'm putting out there is helping, it, making a difference, even in a small way. I have said time and time again, even if I help just one person by sharing my story, I know that I'm doing something right. So I thank you all for listening. I hope you learned something this week and I will be in touch next week with another episode. So stay tuned, friends. Thank you. Take care of yourself. Don't forget to be your own advocate. I appreciate you. I love you. And thanks for tuning in.